when making languages, you need words. Where do you get words from? Words are defined as single, distinct, meaningful elements of speech or writing, and are constructed of one or more morphemes, uh, which are the elements of language, the bits of meaning that can't be split up any further. Uh, so what exactly is and isn't a word is somewhat difficult to define, because let's be honest, that definition's kinda crap. But for the sake of this video, I'm just going to assume you already know basically what a word is. So when you're making a language, there are plenty of different places you might want to get your words from. Maybe you're creating a philosophical language, where every individual sound adds categorization to what you're talking about to come up with a perfect, logically consistent name for everything. Maybe a natural language, where every word is a new, interesting, and beautiful way of saying something. Or maybe even a fictional mutant zonal orcs lang between two long dead languages, one of which we're not even sure of more than three words of, and then pick the least documented family tree it could have been to build the language out of. But I mean, who would ever do that? So we'll be doing natural languages here. Now you might ask, where exactly do natural languages come from? First, there's words being made from other words. Oh, it's a fruit that looks a bit like a pine cone. It's a pineapple. A game where you hit a ball with your foot? Football. And this might sound pretty obvious, but plenty of words you might not expect come from compounding like this. Neighbor? No, that's a nequas gaburro. This also applies to sticking morphology onto existing words like rely, reliable, unreliable, unreliability. Of course, these aren't really new root words. I mean, if they were, the Eskimo languages would have hundreds of different words for snow. Which they don't. So at its core, entirely new root words come from one of two places, crap people make up, and loan words, which are also, if you go far enough back, crap people make up. Now, it's a little more than that. Words like meow sound like <coughs> for a reason, but ultimately there's no formula for creating new root words. Uh, going back to neighbor, the first part, nechoaz, meaning near, can be traced further and further back, all the way up, to Proto-Indo-European Hnek. And then, nothing. We just don't know. That's 6,500 years of history, and it's still nothing compared to the at least 100,000 years since language started. Now there are many interesting, complex, and overwhelmingly scientific sounding theories for how language originally started, ranging from the Bow Wow theory to the Poo Poo theory, and of course the fabulous Ding Dong and Yo He Ho theories. Regardless, there are plenty of different theories for where language comes from, but ultimately, if you're making a new language from scratch, you're going to need to make up some roots. So first, what even is a root word? I probably should have added the definition earlier in the script. Root words are basically just the most basic forms of words that have no compounding, prefixes, suffixes, infixes, circumfixes, duplifixes, transfixes... There's a lot of kinds of fixes. For reference, in a naturalistic conlang, most of your words shouldn't be root words, but most of the basic concepts speakers are likely to see a lot of, uh, like sand if you live in a desert, or people called Bruce if you're an Aussie, should have root words. As for making the roots themselves, just making them up as you go is a decent strategy, but some people will speed this up with generators, and how do you use them? Go to this website, put constants here, vowels here, you get the graph, oh crap, use the IP symbol with a line in between, then go sticky syllable structure, fiddle with these things, and BAM! Words. Oh, that took a lot of takes. Anyway, there's a lot more that can be done here, like BAM, only nasals and fricatives in the coda, BAM, only non-approximate approximate clusters in the onset, and BAM, Unicode combining characters, adding tones. And there, it makes words for example-ish. That's the example language I've made in other videos, you can find it, it looks like this. So you get some basic words and give them translations. The most important thing to remember here is not just copying English semantic meanings into the conlang's words. This comes in a couple of ways. The first is how specific the words are. For example, look at colours. If you're English, this is red and this is pink, but this is blue and this is also blue. If you're Russian, on the other hand, Guluboy and Sini are just as different as Rosevi and Krasny. And then there's Piraha, with no colour words, just light and dark, because Piraha was made by aliens. How come I can understand you? Are you using some sort of neural language router? Actually, I'm speaking... Piraha. Idiot. <laughs> now, colours are one of the more boring distinctions here. The fun part is talking about the interesting cultural stuff. 
Take the Incan system for naming different ages. Very interesting. Very telling of how the society worked. Very not English. You also need to bear in mind words with more than one meaning. Now, I'm not talking about homophones here. They're words that just happen to sound the same, but they're entirely unrelated. Like how sight and sight sound the same, but they've got completely unrelated meanings and etymological histories. What I am talking about are words with multiple meanings because of how the culture views things. A simple one is how we call the thing that solves a puzzle a key, even though we're not talking about a small piece of shaped metal with incisions to fit in a lock. A key to a lock and a key to a puzzle are entirely different things, but we associate keys with things that open metaphorical doors too. They're the same word. Now, this is the pretty basic one. It's a pretty easy connection to make, and any culture with locks and keys could come across it. But of course, there are plenty of other ways problems could be put into words. If you've got some kind of major chanting religion, maybe you've found the chant for the problem. Heck, if you're in a magical scenario, everything could just be spells. Of course, you don't just want to make every English correspondence into a conlangs one. Just always have in mind how your speakers see the world when creating new words. Rolling back to when we were making words, most words aren't root words. Most words are made of other words, whether it's obvious or not. This is done with derivational affixes. For reference, a derivational affix is one that changes the meaning of a word, where an inflectional affix changes the circumstances around it. Dragon and dragons are both talking about the concept of the dragon, despite the affix. But dragon and dragon fruit are different words with different meanings, very different meanings here, because fruit is being used as a derivational affix. So the first thing to remember is that it's pretty common for a normal root word to start being used as a derivational affix until the original word just becomes one. Consider how the suffix ology, like in biology, theology, and I have to look up the etymology for that word, foraminferology, which honestly sounds like symbolicsology to me, all come from this affix, logi, which comes from this affix, which comes from... Well, you get the idea. It all comes from this ancient Greek word meaning explanation. The same kind of thing can happen the other way around too. The word rupt isn't used anymore, but combinations of a derivational affix and rupt, like disrupt, erupt, interrupt, corrupt, and rupture, remain, as do a lot of other uses, like bankrupt. Rupt just really gets around. When dealing with derivational affixes and compounding, it's also important to remember rebracketing. Obviously, when speaking, people generally have some idea of the boundaries between bits of meaning, the morphemes in words. Especially if you're dealing with loan words, people are likely to start changing what they consider the boundaries between the morphemes to be to match their expectations. The word helicopter originally comes from two Greek words meaning spiral and wing, uh, with the boundary between helico and pter. But at this point, an English speaker would identify the split between heli and copter, both of which are used as derivational affixes for other words like jetcopter and heliport. So let's generate some words like this. Take the word for heart, ram. Maybe the speakers associate the heart with being the centre and most important point of the body. Uh, for reference, this is a very common bit of symbolism across cultures and really not very interesting, but given this language literally has no background culture, I'm going to stick to the boring stuff. Anyway, hearts could be compounded with other words to talk about central and important parts of other things. Uh, maybe an egg yolk is an egg's heart, or the moon is the heart of the night. So, heart is ram, egg is nyoch, and night is jesas. Now, how are they combined? Well, it really depends on the word order, specifically whether adjectives come before or after nouns. Uh, we'll say they come after. So if you were saying egg's heart in examplish, you would say Ram, Nyohyom. Now, when they combine into one word, the possessive om suffix might be retained, like in doomsday, uh, but we're going to drop it though. There's also the matter of tone. In examplish, tone is supposed to go over the whole word. So, how does that work here? Well, the tones affect each other. Tone Sunday isn't something I've actually spent any time talking about, just to keep things simple, but that's when tones are affected by other nearby tones. So we'll just add a right dominant system for compounds, hence the tone of the last syllable, or word here, is dominant and just takes over the word. In the orthography we'll still mark it on the leftmost syllable though to keep things clear. So finally, ramwush is yoke, and 
Ram Jesus is moon. Next, a loan word. Let's say the speakers of Examplish come across the Maganor people and hear of a planet called Earth, or in Makwo, Eurobizor. Various processes will occur here. At first, there are the problems of phonology. Makwo and Examplish phonologies are different, so the word Eurobizor, spoken by someone with Examplish as their first language, would probably be more like Europiso plus tone, which can come from various places. Stress could become high tone, stress could become rising and falling tone, there could just be a default tone for loan words, etc. Since the stress was originally near the end of the word, we'll just make that a high tone and give the whole word a rising tone. Also, for reference, the Maganor are a group of people canonically from Earth, specifically late antiquity Europe, hence why their writing system is a mutated form of Latin and Greek, of which this is just a simplification. Uh, I don't actually think capital Pi acute is a good way of spelling buh, and that's also why the word for planet Earth literally translates as Big Europe. Speaking of which, the Examplish folks might come up with entirely different headcanons about what's in Europiso. Say the Examplish folks go to a new world with lots of mountains. They might just look around it and be like, okay, I guess this is Tasenpiso, when originally the suffix was just Izor and meant big, so that's rebracketing. But around here you may have concluded you need to go through these complex processes for every new derivational affix, and this just isn't the case. The best way to make a naturalistic conlang, at least in my experience, is to create a proto-language and a modern variety of the language, usually at the same time, where you simulate the standard effects of phonological, lexical and grammatical evolution onto the proto-lang to make the modern one. I'm not going over that in this video, but it is worth mentioning that for some very common and simple derivational affixes, it is just reasonable to have them exist already in the proto-lang without any further history. Uh, the ish suffix in English, for example, has been a suffix for as long as we can trace it back, for which for reference is iskos, in Proto-Indo-European 6,500 years ago. The meaning has changed a bit, but unless your conlang's history goes back to the start of time, it's not going to make it look any less naturalistic to throw in some derivational affixes at the start. For that matter, you should also bear in mind for what periods of time your derivational affixes are productive, that is, when they're making new words, and generally when they exist. If they're new, phonological evolution won't have messed with them too much, and the individual words will still be clear but older ones tend to be less clear to speakers. Anyway, I have a new mic now. This is, I suppose, the third video in an unofficial sort of how to make languages series, so here's the rest of the series. And, and like some other video, plus the subscribe button so you can, you know, thanks for watching.